Good morning. Okay, so we are going to be in Isaiah 10 through 11. I believe that's what we're in. Let me see. Yes. Right? I think we're in Isaiah 10 through 11. Nope, that's the wrong one. We're in this one. Isaiah 12 through 14. I don't know why it didn't give me that. Okay, so we're in Isaiah 12 through 14. And we're going to go ahead and open in prayer. We're on Thursday. Um, Thursday the 13th, I believe, right? Yep. Almost the weekend. We've almost made it. All right, let's go ahead and open in prayer. Lord, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for meeting us new every morning. Lord, I just ask that you would um, speak to my heart. And I pray that you would speak to those that hear the word, and I pray that it would give them a hunger to want to dig deeper for themselves. Lord, I pray that you would just continue to meet our needs, that you would show us what you'd have us to do, that you would give us strength to walk through our trials, and that you would give us joy every morning, and that we can acknowledge that you are God and that we are not. Thank you so much for all that you do for us that we don't even realize, Lord, in Jesus' name. God is the God that loves you and cares about you and is giving you this day. Be excited, be glad, and let's get into the word, okay? Okay, so again, in Isaiah 12 through 14, the Lord is my strength and my song. Isaiah is a prophet in the Old Testament, and he is writing this. And a prophet would get the word from the Lord and then speak it to the people. Now, the people were... Or, not following after God and God was trying to give them guidance and direction through his prophets and Isaiah is the prophet that we're reading about at this time okay the Lord is my strength and my song you will say in that day I will give thanks to you O Lord for though you were angry with me your anger turned away that you might comfort me behold God is my salvation I will trust and will not be afraid for the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Can you say that today? That God is your salvation, that you trust him, that you're not afraid. He is your strength. He's your song. What does that mean? That means that the words that you speak are giving honor and praise and glory to God. Not to yourself, not to others, not to happenstance, but to God, right? With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this may be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. God is the Holy One of Israel. God chose the people of Israel. God chose Abraham from the beginning of Genesis, called him out of where he was, in his comfort, in his city. He had a lot. He, he had everything he needed there. But God called him to a place he did not know to become a people he had no idea or could ever conceive and understand and he became out of him came the holy nation of the, the nation of israel to be the people of god well the judgment of babylon is next uh, chapter 13 the oracle concerning babylon which isaiah the son of amaz saw now there was this oracle against babylon because of what they had done to Israel. So on a bare hill, raise a signal, cry aloud to them, wave the hand for them to enter the gates of the nobles. I myself have commanded my consecrated ones and have summoned my mighty men to execute my anger, my proudly exalting ones. So God has allowed Babylon to do what they did to Israel, to bring them to a point of them understanding and acknowledging him is their God. Now, that doesn't mean that they are not going to get disciplined, Babylon, for what they have done to the people of Israel, right? You pretty much never want to be against the people of Israel, because to be against the people of Israel is to be against God. And I personally don't want to be against God, 
just saying. So verse four, the sound of a tumult is on the mountains as of a great multitude. The sound of an uproar of kingdoms, the nation of nations gathering together. The Lord of hosts is mustering a host for battle. They come from a distant land from the ends of the heavens, the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. God is not going to forget the wrongs done to his people. God may allow these things to happen for a time, but it's only to bring us and them back to a point of remembering that he is God and we are not, of honoring, praising, and giving him glory, crying out to him in that hour of need instead of ourselves. And when we get to that point, then we have relation with God, but then God will deal with those that have oppressed us. Wail for the day of the Lord is near as destruction from the Almighty, it will come. If God says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. God always does what he says he's going to do. Therefore, all hands will be feeble and every human heart will melt. They will be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation, to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. The ruthless, the arrogant, the evil of the world, they think they are above reproach. They think there is no reckoning. Unfortunately, they are incorrect. There is a reckoning. There is a day when you will stand account for what you have done. And it's not that God hates these people and is against these people and it's God against them. It, it's not. They have chose to reject the one true God. They have chose to not have a relationship with their creator. So their creator is having to pass judgment on his creation, the creation that does not want to follow after him because it is our choice, right? It's always our choice to have relation with God. God doesn't force us to have a relationship with him. That's not love. Just like in any normal relationship, one being forced to do something for another is not love. One doing out of love for another that's a true relationship, right? Okay, verse 12, I will make people more rare than fine gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. And like a hunted gazelle or like sheep with none to gather them, they will turn to his own people and each will flee to his own land. And we see that God is scattering the peoples. They are not being gathered together. We scatter when we are in fear. We gather when there's peace. So whoever is found will be thrust through and whoever is caught will fall by the sword. Why? Why is God allowing this carnage to happen, right? It's because those people did not trust or have relation with God. So they are not God's people. You know, it is your choice. No one is forcing you to become God's people. But in order to, uh, I see some coconut oil in my hair. Squirrel, definitely a squirrel moment. Sorry. Um, in order for you to stand as a child of God, you have to have relationship with God. Those that do not have relationship with God would then flee God, right? Because God is against them. Um their infants will be dashed in pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered. Their wives ravished. This is horrible, right? This is not God's best. This is not God's will that this would happen. But because they have no relationship with God, God has no relationship with them. Do we? I hope you understand that. God loves you sent his son to die for you. You have been given a free gift of salvation. The, the things we're talking about are not what God desires for you, but it's what we have chosen when we choose to reject God.
Behold, I am stirring up the meads against them who have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. Their bowls, bows will slaughter the young men. They will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans, will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. Because God will, God does, God has, God is, and God will always be righteous and true and holy. And though things that are evil and ugly happen in the world around us, nothing is outside of God's hand and God's, God's sphere of influence. And these things that are happening are happening because people have rejected God. This is what happens with the rejection of God. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherds will make their flocks lie down there. But wild animals will, do, will lie down there. And their houses will be full of howling creatures. Their ostriches will dwell and wild, and their wild, their, their ostrich, their, T-H-E-R-E, -E, their ostriches will dwell and there wild goats will dance. Hyenas will cry in its towers and jackals in the pleasant pa palaces. Its time is close at hand and its days will not be prolonged. Time is short, today is the day. You are not promised tomorrow. We're not even promised this whole day. We're promised right now, this moment. What are you doing with this moment? What we do with the name of Jesus Christ is what we stand accountable for. And maybe you didn't know that before right now this moment, but unfortunately right now at this moment, now you know. And you will stand before the Lord and he will ask you, what did you do with the name of my, my son, Jesus Christ? What did you do with my son? And it's on you what you decide, what you would do with Jesus Christ. Are you going to have a relation with him? Are you not going to have a relationship with him? To not have a relationship with God is to be against God. There is only black and white, A or B. There's no middle ground. There's no in between. We're either for or against God. Chapter 14, the restoration of Jacob. For the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and will again choose Israel and will set them in their own land and sojourners will join with them and will attach themselves to the house of Jacob. Why is God doing this? Because this is his people and he is their God. And when we come into personal relationship with God, we are his people and he is our God. And the peoples will take them and bring them to their place and the house of Israel will possess them in the Lord's land as male and female slaves. They will take captive those who were their captors and rule over those who oppressed them. Israel's remnant taunts Babylon. When the Lord has given you rest from your pain and turmoil and the hard service with which you were made to serve, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. Now, taunting doesn't seem right, right? It, it, correct? <laughs> it doesn't seem like what God's people should do. But if God is telling us to do it, that's what God's intent was. See, I have like coconut oil in my hair. I know, I'm sorry. Squirrel moment is going on right now. Just sorry. Okay, I will focus again. So how the oppressor has ceased, the insolent fury ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers that struck the peoples in wrath with unceasing blows, that ruled the nations in anger with unrelenting persecution. This is what they did to them. This is why they are being judged because of their anger, because of their wickedness, because of their persecution to the people. It's not like these people were innocent. These were evil, wicked people, okay? The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. The cypresses rejoice at you, the cedars of Babylon, saying, since you were laid low, no woodcutter comes up against us. Sheol beneath is stirred up to meet you when you come. Sheol is a word in the Old Testament for hell. Hell and Sheol is simply put anything in a place separated from God. To be separated from God is to be in hell, is Sheol. It rouses the shades to greet you, all who were leaders of the earth. It raises from their thrones all who were kings of the nations, 
all of them will answer and say to you, you too have become as weak as we. You have become like us. Your pomp is brought down to Sheol, the sound of your harps. Maggots are laid as a bed beneath you and worms are your covers. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, sun of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. Now you may be wondering, who is this talking? Why, why are they saying this? How are they saying that they, um, that they will ascend to heaven, that their throne will be on high? Who is this? This is Satan. Satan, before he became Satan, was an angel of light most beautiful angel and the problem was he wanted to be more than God better than God exalted over God he didn't even just want to be equal with God he wanted to set his throne on high he will ascend above the stars of God that's not okay like because you're the creation and he is the creator so the creation can never be greater than the creator right i will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north good morning Lori. glad that you're here i will ascend above the heights of the clouds i will make myself like the most high but you are brought down to sheol to the far reaches of the pit those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you is this the man who made the earth tremble who shook kingdoms who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities who did not let his prisoners go home all the kings of the nations lie in glory each in his own tomb but you are cast out away from your grave like a loathed branch clothed with the slain who's those pierced by the sword who go down to the stones of the pit like a dead body trampled underfoot you will not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land you have slain your people may the offspring of evildoers never more be named prepare slaughter for his sons because of the guilt of their fathers lest they rise and possess the earth and fill the face of the world with cities those that are against God will not be allowed to stand. And those that come after them, their, their generations after them, their, their children will not be allowed to stand. Why? Because they are against God. And to allow them to continue in that way would allow the evil to continue. Verse 22, I will rise up against them, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will cut off from Babylon name and remnant, descendants and posterity, declares the Lord. And I will make it a possession of the hedgehog and pools of of destruction. Just said I needed to reconnect and I'm supposed to be on amazing internet so I'm not understanding how that works. Verse 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn as I have planned so shall it be and as I have purposed so shall it stand that I will break the Assyrian in my land and on my mountains trample him underfoot and his yoke shall depart from them and his burden from their shoulder. This is the purpose that is purposed concerning the whole earth. And this is the hand that is outstretched over all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is out, is stretched out, and who will turn it back? No one. No one can turn back the hand of God. So now there's an oracle concerning Philistia. In the year that King Ahaz died came this oracle. Rejoice not, O Philistia, all of you, that the rod has struck you is broken. For from the serpent's root will come forth an adder, and its fruit will be a flying, fiery serpent. And the firstborn of the poor will graze, and the needy lie down in safety. But I will kill your root with famine, and your remnant will it will slay, and your remnant it will slay. Wail, O gate! Cry out, O city! Melt in fear, O Philistia, all of you! For smoke comes out of the north, and there is no straggler in its ranks. What will one answer the messengers of the nation? The Lord has founded Zion, and in her the afflicted of his people find refuge. The people of God find refuge in him throughout any and every situation, right? And that's what we get from our Old Testament reading today. And now we're in 2 Corinthians 13, and this is Paul 
speaking to the Corinth church. Um, this is our New Testament reading. And these are his final warnings to them. So ver uh, chapter 13, verse 1. This is the third time I'm coming to you. Every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So it's not one person saying that this is how everything should be, right? It should be two or three people coming together in one accord in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to accomplish what God's purpose is in their lives. I warned those who sinned before and all the others and I warned them now while absent as I did when present on my second visit that if I come again I will not spare them since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me. He is not weak in dealing with you but is powerful among you. So the Corinthian church has things that are going on that, you know, he dealt with before and he dealt with them again. And now this is the third time he's going there and he's really, he's telling them, you know, I really don't want to deal with this with you guys again. You guys need to get it together, right? For he was crucified in weaknesses, but lives in the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. So we are weak in ourselves, but through him we have the power of God. Through Jesus Christ, we have the power of God. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? When you ask Jesus Christ into your heart, you immediately have a personal relationship with him. The Holy Spirit indwells you and you are a child of God. Your eternal life starts at that moment. And then at that moment, the Spirit of God, Jesus Christ, dwells within you. You are not your own. You are bought at a price. So that's why we post this on some of the selling channels. I was asked that this week. You know, I thought this was a selling group. Why, what are you selling? Is this church group now? And you know what? It, the price has been paid. It's a free gift. Now, if I was giving away something for free on a selling chat group, no one even would have a problem with that. Well, I am. That's what I'm giving away for free, a free relationship with Jesus Christ. So that's why it's on the selling channel, because it's something that I can offer you. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. I am not against the truth. I am for the truth. If what I'm speaking to you seems to be against what God's true word is, then you need to see, search the scriptures and put me in place because I definitely don't want to be against the truth. I want to be for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. For this reason, I write these things while I am away from you, that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. We also have the authority given us to build up and not tear down. It is not our job to tear down people. We love that job. Everybody wants the job of the judge that gets to chop down the fruitless tree, right? We all want to go out there and point them out and put them in their place and get them out of here. That's not your calling, okay? Don't be other people's Holy Spirit, okay? God wants you to build others up. Build them up. Now, if they're wrong and they're like he's talking about, you know, I've come to you now. This is three times. You might still be doing the same wrong thing. He's not telling them to go tear them down. He's telling them to build them up in the truth of God. We don't build others up by tearing them down. We build others up by sharing God's truth with them, right? Finally, greetings. So verse 11, finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Um live in peace and the God of love and peace will be with you when we restore when we're in comfort when we restore when we give comfort when we agree and live at peace the God of peace lives with us I don't know about you but I want God's peace I don't want to live in turmoil I don't want to live in anger I don't want to live in animosity who wants to live in that that is not God's best for you Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So that's just like, have a great day. Love you guys. Talk later. Bye. That's what he's saying. So that's the end of the second Corinthian letter. And that ends our New Testament reading today. And so now we go into Psalms 57. 
and it's titled, Let Your Glory Be Over All the Earth. So this is to the choir master, according to Do Not Destroy. This is a, good morning, Randy, glad that you're here. Um, a mitkum, with miktum, a miktum is a musical term of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. Now this, this scene is David fleeing from Saul. He goes to hide in the cave. Saul camps outside the cave because he doesn't want to just go in the dark cave and then have him hiding somewhere and kill him. So he's, he's camped outside of the cave and David sneaks out of the cave and instead of killing Saul because he has the opportunity to do so, he cuts off a piece of Saul's robe goes back to the cave, daylight comes and he, he comes out the cave and he talks to Saul and he says, Saul, why are you chasing me? And he's like, come out, David, everything's good. We're all good, no worries. And David's like, no, I know we're not good. And you know, I know I could have killed you and I didn't. And he shows him the piece of his cloak and Saul looks and he realizes it's his and he realizes David could have killed him. And then he's like, dude, I was wrong. He doesn't stop wanting to do what he's doing, but he realizes that David is a better man than he is. So this is the song that David writes at that time. Uh, chapter 57 of Psalms. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. So we, with that background knowledge, can see David in the cave. We see him taking refuge in his God. We see him um, in the shadow of God's wings, in the shadow of that cave. And he's waiting for the destruction to pass by, for Saul to pass by. I will cry, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. Selah. Pause. Think about it. David has an opportunity to take out his enemy, and instead he uses that opportunity to show him he means him no harm and let's have peace, right? Pause and think about that. Do we want to take out our enemy and smite them and knock them to the ground? Or are we desiring peace? Are we doing all we can to desire and have the peace of God? God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. That was what David was trying to show Paul that he, or Saul, that he had steadfast love and faithfulness, right? My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts. So that's him in that cave and Saul on the outside, right? The children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows. Those are the men that are with Saul wanting to kill David, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul has bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. The pit they dug to trap David, David shows them you are in your own pit. I'm not in this pit. And he sh when he shows them the cloak, he shows them, see, you are the ones that are, are far from where God wants you to be because you are not right with God. And it says, Selah, pause. Think about it. Think about what God is and what God does and what God is doing in your life today. My heart is steadfast, oh God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake my glory. Awake, O oh harp and lyre, I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O oh Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations for your steadfast love is great to the heavens your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Can you say these things in the midst of the trial you're going through with those that are coming against you, with the things that are coming against you, and you're trying to stand firm and righteous before God? Can you, can you cry out to God and exalt him and acknowledge that his glory is over all the earth? regardless of what your situation is, you can't. In your own strength, you can't. But in God, you can. God is not asking you to do it in your own strength. You may be tired. You're, you may be saying, you know, I can't do this. I can't do this walk. I'm so done with this. And God is saying, I never meant for you to do it. 
this was never meant for you to carry. I, I will carry this and take my yoke. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. The burden and the yoke that God gives us is Jesus Christ. What are we doing with the name of Jesus Christ today? Our goal and our purpose in life is to magnify God and mature his people. How are we doing that today? Okay, that ends our Psalms reading and we go into Proverbs. This is our last reading for today. Proverbs 23, 9 through 11. Do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the good sense of your words. Have you been in that situation where you're speaking truth and you're speaking God's wisdom and knowledge and direction into someone? And then a, a fool, someone who has no relationship with God, that's what they're called because they are rejecting the truth and wisdom of God. So that makes them a fool. No one is making them a fool. God did not make them a fool. Mankind in their foolishness chooses to reject God. And that's why this person's a fool. They re despise the good sense of your words. So maybe you're speaking to someone in regard to the wisdom of, and direction God has given you and a fool speaks up against that good sense. Do not, is that, what do you do in that situation? You don't speak. There's no words. There's no point in arguing with a fool. You drop it and let it go. Do not move an ancient landmark or enter the fields of the farther, fatherless. Do not move an ancient landmark or enter the fields of the fatherless. So the fatherless would be the widows, right? The fatherless are the orphans. For their redeemer is strong, he will plead their cause against you. So what this is talking about is people would move the ancient landmarks. They would say, oh, I'm, maybe this is my adjoining land and we share a fence. And you know what? I'm just going to mm, scoot this a little bit over more to, to your side to increase my territory. Hmm. What's the problem with that? You're stealing. You're stealing what's that other person's. By moving the ancient landmark, it's you taking possession of what's not yours. By entering the fields of the fatherless, is you coming against those that are lacking, that have no direction or father or covering over them. Um, the fatherless and the widows are the ones we're supposed to care for, not take from, right? And the Redeemer is watching out for them. The Redeemer sees the ancient landmarks and knows what is yours and what is theirs. The Redeemer sees the fatherless and makes sure they are cared for. He is strong and he will plead their cause against you. You do not want to be on the other end of God, the Redeemer, pleading the cause against you. Guess why? Because you cannot stand against God pleading his cause, pleading someone's cause against you. You can't stand against the pleadings against you from God. We can't because God is God and we are not. So don't move ancient landmarks. Don't take what is not yours. Don't, don't oppress or come against or disregard the orphans and the widows, but care for them, right? So that's where we end for today. Um, that is our last reading from Proverbs. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Tomorrow is not a flex Friday, so I will be here tomorrow. Those of you that missed me last Friday was because it was a flex Friday. Um, and I'm in a community and my husband's working for um, a base that deals with the flex Fridays. So on Fridays, he's off. So every other Friday, we have a three-day weekend. I know it's just so bizarre such a blessing right you know we get to a point where you're just like god i don't even deserve these blessings and you're just so grateful so i am very grateful for where i am and where i'm at and what god's doing in my life and i hope you can be too and it doesn't mean there are no trials or tribulations to be certain um he just started a new job so you know you do that whole waiting for income for three week thing that's never fun and we're all adjusting to new schedules and new situations and new living environments and that's never fun. And, um, but God, but God, you know, regardless of wherever you are and whatever you're in, but God, God is the answer. God has the plan. God is your hope. God is your future. God is your refuge. God is your strength. Trust in God. Thank you so much. You guys have an excellent day.